My name is Andrew, Andrew Longmore. I'm Nikki. Hi. Where have I been? How long have you been? For a very long time. For a very, very long time. When we get to a kind of date, we'll tell, we'll tell you how long. Um, so yeah, it's great to have you all here. Um, we, do hope, we do hope you all have a good time today. We're looking forward to worshipping, to hearing Steph, uh, teaching the word, to encountering God and whatever he wants to do. Um, but first, it wouldn't be Sunday afternoon if we didn't do the COVID notices. Who's sick of COVID notices? I was thinking about this. Um, I hate singing with a mask on, but I love singing. Um, and at the moment we're allowed to sing, as long as we've got our masks on, but at least we get to sing, which we couldn't do a year ago. So let's be grateful for being able to sing with our masks on. Um, you don't need a mask on when you're sat in your seat. If you're comfortable and you'd like to take it off, do feel free. Um, please wear a mask when you wander around. <laughs> it's hard with the mask on. Um, so yeah, just make yourself comfortable, but please just be aware of one another. Um, we believe that God speaks to us as well as hears us when we pray. Uh, I was praying uh, this morning, actually I was reading my Bible as well. Uh, I'm doing, I'm using the YouVersion app, as some of you all know, and the current one I'm using, uh, uh, the Bible thing, it's linked to the Bible project where you get those cool animations which tell you about the Bible, and it's talking about John's Gospel, and it was talking about how Jesus is now the temple. And I just really stuck with me all day. Jesus is the temple. He's the place that we're meeting in. He's the place where together in. It's through Jesus that we, we meet with God and that we know God. Um, and but that was just something that really has, has encouraged me today. God speaks. As we worship, God may speak to you. In fact, I only find that if I, if I ask him, he's much more likely to speak to me. So uh, I encourage you to, to ask God if there's anything he wants to share and uh, if you feel like God's put something on your heart, come find me, I'll be at the front and we'll, we'll see if we can find a way of, of sharing that because when God speaks we're all strengthened and we're all encouraged. Um, I think that's it for, for this part. I think it's time to introduce Josh. This is Josh. This is to bless us and to lead us into worship. So I'm going to hand over to Josh. Hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, but, great, but should we stand if you're able? Um, we're going to spend some time singing to the Lord this morning. And we're going to start uh, with someone that celebrates the fact that God is consistent. And uh, the reason that that's good is that it means that it doesn't matter what is going on in the world or perhaps in our own individual lives, the Lord is still good. And the Lord is still worth worshipping. And the Lord still has good things for us this morning. So I just encourage you uh, to open up your hearts this morning. It might be you've come uh, from difficult places, it might be you've come from a, a nice happy place, but in any case, uh, why don't we open up our hearts to the Lord this morning and say, have your way in us. Now Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to be present with us today. We thank you that you speak, Lord God, we also ask that you would heal those that need healing, you would release those that need freedom, and you would bring revelation, Father, to those, that, those of us that need guidance this morning, and perhaps just need that fresh vision, that fresh word from you, and we would leave this place invigorated and uh, feeling more able and more inclined to live our lives for you. Oh, 
he wants to say, don't settle for second best. And if there's something that you are feeling is hopeless or you need help with, ask me. Uh, and I, I can do anything, so just ask me. It's not just a philosophy or a set of rules for living, but actually the good news is that we can be in relationship with the God of everything, the one true God. And I thank you, Lord God, that uh, the gospel also doesn't just leave us to uh, think good thoughts and to sit in our little homes being nice people, but actually it moves us to reach out and uh, be Christ's ambassadors in this world where we can see so many problems, so many problems that, uh, yeah, like our needs and the influence of the church, of real believers, real followers and disciples of Christ to come and bring peace and reconciliation and unity with God. So in that theme, we're just going to sing uh, God and all the, uh, the good amount of struggle.
Jesus, eh? you are the risen one. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus, that eh? you put your treasure in jars of clay. Thank you, Jesus, that eh? you turn water into the best wine. And you don't want us to ever settle to second best. Amen. The offering, oh there we go. Sorry. Trying to put the offering slide up. Um, so, uh, thank you all for your generosity if you give regularly. Um, it's great to, to be able to, to do that, to recognize that how much God has blessed us and therefore that we were able to bless God. Uh, if you are giving, if uh, you want to do, uh, if you want to start regularly giving, talk to Mark. You can sort things out. If you ever want to just do a, a one-off offering, if you feel like, do you know what? God's been really good this week. I want to make an offering. Then uh, the simplest way these days is just a back transfer, sort code and the account numbers there. That's what I often do. Um, just makes life easier. Okay, uh, Nikki, you have the notices. All right, um, I think everybody knows the kids and youth are going out today, um, so that's hopefully okay and not news to anybody. Um, we have a couple of exciting things coming up. Who knows what might actually be happening next month? It might be Christmas. What? I know it's outrageous, isn't it? How did that happen? Um, we've got a couple of um, really good opportunities to invite friends, family, neighbours, anyone else that you can possibly throw an invite at um, to a couple of services. We've got one here on the 12th at half three in the afternoon and one on the 19th at half past ten in Boundary. Do go to both, even if you don't live in one of those places. We don't live in Anna, we'll go to both. Um, <laughs> so yeah, come along, bring people if you can, bring neighbours. If not, just come and be an extra person in the room. Give us a good crowd, make it a really good opportunity uh, just to tell people about Jesus and how much he loves them. People are a bit more open at Christmas, aren't they? We can talk about our faith. Somehow it's a bit easier. Um, there's a really great event for youth. I'm looking around the room and thinking there's absolutely nobody in this room who is the right age. Um, but there is a great event for the youth on the 17th of December. I know a couple of people in this room who've been and really enjoyed it. I've got kids who went and really enjoyed it. Um, if you want to go and help, they really appreciate the help because, you know, a bunch of 11 to 18 year olds all in a room for a very long time overnight requires adults to keep them sensible and to help them have lots of organised fun and some chaotic fun as well. Um, so that's on the 17th of December. The details are all in the notices that Anna sent out this week. Um, and one more thing, which has just literally been announced in the last week or so, is it going to be an opportunity to go camping next year? Who loves camping? Me! So there's a couple of opportunities to do that. Um, the details are all in the notice sheet. Um, and it's going to be uh, an opportunity to go to the big church day out together as a group of churches and that will be our whole sphere so that will be people from Lifehouse and people from Oxford and Vista and, and Kippington and everywhere else. Um, yeah, so it'll be really, really great. Good time to do that together. Um, so there's the big church day out and the world cars. If you're interested in booking that, you need to do it through the link on the newsletter. Don't just go and book to go to big church day out because you won't camp in the right place which is half the point of going to camp with your mates, because then it's more fun. Um, so if you want any more information about that, just ask one of us. Um, okay, so we have the wonderful Stephanie preaching to us today. She's slightly nervous, so smile at her and be really calm. So, don't tell them that you're nervous. Okay, can I pray for you? All right. Father God, we want to thank you that you have been speaking to us through Nehemiah. 
Father, thank you that we've been discovering more of you as we read parts of your word. Father, we want to thank you for the preparation that Stephanie has put into you today. Father, thank you that we get to hear her, uh, even though it's maybe a couple of weeks later than we were thinking. Father, thank you that she can speak to us today. Uh, Father, would you inspire her with your word and help us to open our hearts and hear what she has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One more thing to my ears, because I'm not already doing enough. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Good afternoon. Look at that bold capital letters. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, I'm Stephanie. I'm part of the leadership forum here at Lighthouse. Uh, outside of that, I am a project manager, most recently in events and helping offices get rid of all the paper, things like that. But previous to that, worked a lot with those in poverty in particular, to helping people out of food poverty and debt. So covering AMI as a project manager, helping people out of debt is uh, very close to my heart. As Nikki mentioned, it's a bit of a flashback. Um, it was meant to follow chapter 4, unsurprisingly, given that we're going to go to chapter 5. Um, but I was ill, thank God I'm fine now, and so we're going to go back there. Uh, the passage is super rich, we're going to get to it in a minute. And there are about 400 roads we could have gone down, but I don't think any of you would appreciate that very much. So instead, rather practically, we're going to start at the start. Work, the way, work our way through it, and then at the end, in true sermon fashion, I'm going to give you three points. Um, but as they're so beautifully weaved through the passage, I'm actually just going to spoil it and give you the three points right now. Um, so the three key things that are going to come out as we get to the passage, in my opinion, are, um, and I want you to look out for them, that's why I'm telling you them now, right? So look out for the way the community shifts and changes, or ought to, spoilers. Um, the way that they treat each other as a family, and then finally the way that they repent. I will, we'll come back to them later, and not while I want to turn around them. Uh, so some overview. This, we're talking about Nehemiah 5. So this is the Israelites, God's people, they've been in exile. The Babylonians who exiled them are out, the Persians, who are just another empire, are in. But importantly, they seem to want a bunch of gods on their side. Which means when the, some of the Israelites come and say, I want to go back, the king is inclined to grant that. Which is what Nehemiah does. Um, he hears the cities in ruins. And what he does, I think, is the exact reason that I've loved reading about Nehemiah. Because this feels like exactly what I would have done. We went, oh, there's a problem over there I should deal with. So I'm going to need wood and timber. I'm going to need letters for when people question me. And he goes into like full project mode to get to it all. Uh, and I respect that. I'm from so he gets back to Jerusalem. He starts building the wall. And as Steve Jones touched on when he covered chapter four, it's a keystone project. So it's about more than just building a wall for the sake of building a wall. It's about rebuilding lives and the economy and the safety of the city. And then in chapter four, there's a bunch of external opposition. There's kind of an obvious baddie who shows up and goes, you'll never do that, I'll kill you and I'll knock down your wall and all sorts of things like that. So you've got half the people still trying to build the wall, the other half kind of poised with their swords, ready to fight this enemy. People are taking their weapons with them when they're going for water. It's, it's a dangerous time. I mean, we know that that attack never comes, but they don't have this bit of the Bible yet. So, is that something we need to do? <laughs> um, so for them, it's dangerous. And yeah, that brings us to the passage, which Ori is gonna come and read for us. Once he's confirmed that's not his car. <laughs> I'm 80% sure. <laughs> I don't think my car alarm works, so we're fine. Yeah. 
say that in public. <laughs> Take that as the edit. <laughs> So, um, yeah, Nehemiah 5, uh, entitled Nehemiah Helps the Poor. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are new ones. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still, others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay for the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards were locked up. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are exacting usury from your own country. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. And now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet as they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemy? And I and my brothers and my men are also lending the money and grain. But let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, their vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the usury you were charging hundredth part of the money, the grain, the new wine, and the oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. And then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe, and I said, in this way may God shake out of his house and possessions every man who does not keep his promise. And may such a man be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, Amen. And they praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Thank you. Do you just realise we should have got you a rule that you could have dramatically I shaken out? Can't believe we missed that. <laughs> It actually feels like quite a lot as a chapter, that's not quite all of it. Um, it's quite intense that here in the middle of God's great plan to restore his city and his people, we've got a whole chapter that barely even mentions that and what that looks like. Wow! So, um, we're going to work through the chapter, so if you have it in front of you, scroll to it. Chapter five, uh, verse 5, it's also chapter 5. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and our children are as good as theirs, yet we have had to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. But we are powerless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. So this is the voice of the workers in the community who rented their farms. Typically they would have been out working farm, working the land, to get food for themselves and then all the excess they'd be selling to pay for the rent and the taxes and whatever else it was that they needed. And that would have been working for a long time, except now God, through Nehemiah, has shifted the focus away from that to rebuilding the community, and in this place, the wall. Because the thing we have to note about them building the wall is that Nehemiah didn't come along and go, we need to build the wall. So bring me the carpenters and the masons and all the crafted, skilled people. Bring me the experts. Skilled craftspeople. <laughs> bring me the experts. Instead, he goes, we need to build this wall and it benefits everybody and it matters. So everybody's going to come out and they actually all do the bit in front of their house for the most part. 
And so their typical life has been shifted intentionally and for good reason. And here they are being thrown into debt because of it, which I don't think is terribly fair. Um, but I also imagine that they couldn't have won either way. I suspect that, I'm speculating here, but if they had stopped working the, on the wall and then on the farms, everybody would have said, oh, do you not care if we die? Come on, there's an attack here, this is our protection. And if they'd done the opposite, everybody saying, oh, well, you should have just worked your land better. You didn't get a good crop. That feels like your fault. <laughs> and so in verse 5, they end up screaming out, we are powerless. And I want to just note here as well, actually, following on from Julie's word earlier, if you feel like you're in that place of screaming, we are powerless, take that to Jesus like she encouraged us. So on the flip side of that, we've got the wealthy, right? So the people who own the land. So they presumably aren't struggling to feed their families at all. They're raking in the money and the interest and everything else they need. And the thing that I specifically want to say about them is that, unlike in chapter four, where there's a specific baddie that comes and is trying to attack the work of God, the landowners here aren't deliberately trying to throw people into debt or poverty, or certainly you don't have a sense of that. They, for the most part, are acting perfectly reasonably. They own land, and they're charging people rent for using it. That's fine. We still do that. Even Nehemiah himself and all those men are also doing it. But there are two issues with this so-called appropriate behaviour. Firstly, um, the circumstances have changed. So it was reasonable to be charging rent on the land when people were working the land and making enough money for it. But now the focus of the whole community has changed and suddenly it doesn't quite feel so reasonable anymore. And I suspect actually that the landowners hadn't stopped to think about that. It's not particularly relevant to their lives. And it reminds me, I'm just looking for the teachers, of the kind of thing that my teachers used to say to me, to the other people around me, I mean, because I was a perfect shape. Um, which is, just because you can, doesn't mean you shouldn't. Which, to be fair to the teachers, is biblical. Um, in 1 Corinthians, Apostle Paul writes, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And that feels like what's happening here. They're exercising their rights, but it's not beneficial. It's not good for others. And it's definitely not constructive, given that it's distracting from the construction. Um, and the other exception to them behaving appropriately The other exception is that the Israelites are living under an old covenant, so not the same one we do. It's the laws that came from God through Moses, the headlines were on the tablets, those ones. Um, and the one that is particularly relevant here is in Deuteronomy 23, where it says, Do not charge a fellow Israelite interest, you see where I'm going with this, with their own money or food or anything else. You may charge a foreigner interest, but not a fellow Israelite, so that the Lord your God may bless you in everything you put your hand to. You may charge a foreigner interest. So we could just go here, ah, they broke the rules, bad landowner, let's get on. But actually that tells us something about the culture that they were in at the moment, that this is a much bigger issue than I charged you some interest and I probably shouldn't have. It's highlighting that they're actually failing to treat each other as the family that they ought to be. They're failing not only just to be compassionate to their fellow Israelites, 
but even to recognize them as their fellow Israelites. So these are God's chosen people. They've got huge shared history. They're related. Not that I want to try and put some names on their religions, but they're a family. A family who have taken to treating each other as strangers. Which is an unfortunate reality, actually, but it's still true today for too many. So what do they do about it? I have already read this, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. Um, so when I, that is named Maya, heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them and then accused them. He calls them all together um, and accuses them and they keep quiet for they could find nothing to say. So Nehemiah continues, what you were doing is not right. Let us lend them grain, but stop charging interest. Give them back immediately their fields, their vineyards, all their groups and houses, and also all the interest you are charging them. We will give it back, they say, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Which is quite a remarkable response, actually. Um, I certainly don't think that I'm so quick when people come and say, here's something you did wrong to go, oh yeah, I'll give it back, I'll do as you say. There's a little bit of wrestling in there first. <laughs> yeah, may we be that quick to repent when others cry out. And it strikes me here as well that Nehemiah didn't need to get involved in this. So he was a leader within the community, but he could have easily done nothing, right? He could have sat back and said, that's how it is. What are you going to do about it? People won't change. But his desire for justice outweighed his comfort and his apathy and any potential disbelief he had about the impact he could make. And so as his love and concern for the people propels him into action, it is actually entirely effective in this circumstance. And the other thing I want to say here, which is a whole other sermon in itself, so I'm not going to go too far into it, but we can talk about it after if you want, is that the responsibility for getting out of poverty was not with the people who were in the poverty. And that it was true then and it is true now. The people who are in the depth of the poverty and the despair do not have the resources whether that's energy or finances or whatever it is, to take themselves out of it. So the circumstances are often far more complex than that. It is the responsibility of the people who have an overflow, who've got time and money and energy and influence within the community to actually step in and change the structures that was causing the problems. But we won't go too far into that. <laughs> if you get the newsletter, which if you don't, you should, um, in the next few weeks I will put something together about some of the local charities who are doing this kind of work to actually help people out of poverty. Um, should you want to know more about that and how to be involved. Have written a whole sermon on that. But here's the key thing that stood out to me in all of this, especially when comparing it to chapter 4, is that the genuine threat to God's work doesn't come from the enemy, from the external enemy. It came from the internal one, it came from God's own people. So there was a threat where the enemy comes in chapter 4 and says, that's the worst wall I've ever seen. I build it better with lolly sticks and I'll knock it down with my pinky finger. That's not in there, I'm paraphrasing. Um, 
that's not actually what halts the work. It was God's people who sat back and said, that's not my problem. I don't get involved in the farming. It's not really my kind of thing. Genuine threat to God's work is not the external enemy, but his own people. Because in chapter 4, with all the sneering and threats and whatever, Nehemiah deals with it almost dispassionately to a certain extent. He goes a bit like, yeah, well, let them threaten us. You take your sword over there and we'll fight if they come, kind of thing. But with this internal strife, there's protests from the people, Nehemiah goes away and ponders it, there's accusing, there's correcting, there's a significant halt, it seems, in the work for the sake of getting the community back online. And that doesn't surprise me, actually, either, because I certainly find it much easier to fight the obvious enemy. If someone comes and with the death threat, you can go, well, that's an enemy, I've got to fight that. But it is much harder to day in, day out, choose to grace and love and forgiveness for those who are in and out of our world. And so coming back to those three points that I promised, I actually struggled with deciding what to call them. I don't know whether they're three dreams or visions or desires. I've gone in the end for just calling them three prayers that I have for me and for you, but mostly for us as a church and as a community. And so firstly, may we be people who shift as the community does. Like in the passage here where in pre previous seasons, the practices have been fine and they've been safe. And now as the priority has changed, they've become exploitative and divisive and causing problems. Yeah. Would we not do that, quite simply? Yeah. Lord, would you make us a people who shift and grow as the needs of our community, both inside and outside of the church, do. Amen. Secondly, may we treat each other as family, or community, or insert whatever word feels like it suits you here. Because I wonder in the passage whether the poverty and the division and the distraction from God's work would have been avoided if they'd actually just been behaving in the way they ought to in the first place. Because we make allowances for those we love. We listen to them and we say, oh, why haven't you paid your rent? Oh, well, because you had a death threat yesterday. Fair enough. <laughs> I hope that that's not true for any of you. Yeah, Lord, would you unite us as a family as a community who love and care for and cherish each other. For your sake. Amen. And finally, it's just put so beautifully in here, I couldn't move on without saying about acknowledging how quick we are to repent. May we be a church who repent quickly, like they do here. Um, we will give it back. We will do as you say. Makes it feel quite simple, doesn't it? If they complain about it and kick up a fuss first and defend their own corner, we certainly don't get a glimpse of it. And would that be true for us? Lord, would you make us a people who are open to correction? both from you and from others? And would we be quick to repent and to correct where we've gone on? Amen.
I feel like as we come to finish today that God wants to soften parts of our hearts in these areas. Whether they're it's to do with the community, shifting, treating each other as family, or being quicker to repent. <coughs> so we're actually going to be quiet and reflect. I want you to ask God whether he's highlighting one of those areas that he has brought in for you. And perhaps Josh could come as well. Now the goal with this, obviously, is not to shame you or to make you feel terrible or to have you sit around and think of all the things that you've done wrong. Because we all do it. We let our hearts harden and become bitter and all sorts of things. Because we're human and we're broken and we're imperfect. But as we've been so wonderfully reminded this morning, this afternoon, so close. <laughs> There is hope for us, imperfect humans, as we reach out towards a perfect God. And so I think those three points are going to come up on the screen. And Josh is going to play, play quietly. And then when you're ready, there is bread and there is wine, it's juice. There is also gluten-free bread. Um, that you can come and bring those things back to Jesus. And focus on him because he's already accounted for it all. He's already taken it all. I had a, a bad day about how how when you peel an onion, it's not always pleasant. When you do, there's, there's good stuff inside. And I, I found that like honest for now. Sometimes, sometimes your parents will smile on your pleasant, but we do because it's really insects us why you could cry again. Do, do come, uh, get some bread, get some juice. When we do this, we remind ourselves that Jesus is dying for us, that we can be like him.
Meeting is officially coming to an end. <laughs> We've finished in quite a peaceful and sensitive <laughs> uh, place. God is good. If anybody wants prayer, we can pray. Um, because God is here still. If not, next week we are. Uh, I should check. It's fairly well into. Bamboo and Bathory, Bistro Okay, bless you.